hear the word of the prophet Joel. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Time to weep from the porch to the altar. Sometimes we want for prayer to be fun. That don't sound a whole lot of fun to me. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Weep from the porch to the altar. Yeah. Lord, would you just bless these few thoughts to us as we come around your word now. Speak very deeply to us, we pray. Thank you for your encouragement to my own heart as I've just prepared this. Pray that you bless us right now in Jesus' name. Amen. I think first and foremost, we need to understand that prayer is a discipline. Um, there used to be a, a, a preacher, he, he, did, he did go off the rails, although some of the stuff he wrote I still read. And got a guy called Larry Lee, he was back in the 80s, for some people who remember it. Uh, and he used to talk about um, going from discipline in prayer to desire, to delight. And I guess it's kind of the same when you start the gym first. It's the discipline. And then there comes a desire to get there the first few times you don't really want to go. And then there's a desire to get there and to get even fitter. And then all, 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 all of a sudden it becomes a delight and you move into a different gear. But it, also, it always starts with the discipline of saying, I'm going to do this, uh, whether I feel like it or not. And I think, unfortunately, for the church in our generation, we're too much driven by what we feel instead of being disciplined and knowing what God's word says and just getting on with it. And um, I was just thinking about that. And I just want to say to some of you, um, especially for us who have prayed over a long period of time over the same things, God's heard your prayers. You need to understand that God has heard your prayers. We looked at that, didn't we, when we looked at... Uh, Daniel, and he was praying, and finally the angel broke through after 21 days. He said, God heard your prayer, Daniel, the first time that you prayed it, but there's been a whole lot of battling going on before the answer came. But the important thing to understand tonight is that God hears our prayers. And we can't measure how we feel against that, because sometimes we don't like feel like God's heard our prayers. I don't know about with you, have you have sometimes, especially in your own private time of prayer, have you ever felt like your prayers have just been bouncing off the ceiling? That you've kind of tried to multiply some words and say some things to God and it just got all jumbled and confused and you've sat there with your Bible open and you, and you closed your Bible and thought that was a waste of time. It is never a waste of time when we pray. And you cannot measure your prayer time by how you feel. But what we can do is measure our prayer time to the extent of how we've come into agreement with what God says and what his will is. So that's why it's important in our quiet time we don't just pray out stuff that we want, but that we read our Bible and pray the word of God. As we begin to confess God's word, it's his will, you know. And we're going to just look at this a little bit. A moment. I'm going to talk a little bit a moment about praying in faith. But praying in faith really is just taking God at his word and say, I trust you. We said that about war warfare, didn't we, the other day, that warfare has two aspects, really. It's the, the worship element to where we tell God we love him, how precious he is, how wonderful he is, how big he is, how, how much he loves us, and we say all those things about him, and we magnify his name. And the second thing about intercession is about when we get into, um, into his word and we declare what he's promised over us. So we're not just declaring about who he is, but what he has already promised. And I think sometimes we might not feel like we've made any headway, but as long as we're using his word, things are happening in a spiritual realm that we do not see. Do you get that? Because sometimes we get a little bit frustrated, maybe in a church prayer meeting. You know, it's a bit like when people say to me, I didn't enjoy the worship this morning. And you know what my retort is. Well, we didn't come to worship you anyway. It's a bit like saying, oh, well, that was a bit of a dull prayer meeting. Who are we to judge? If, if it's coming from our heart and, and we're engaging with God, it might not be as noisy as perhaps we wanted it to be or as kind of interesting as we want it to be. Man, I've been to some boring prayer meetings, have you? Where you wished somebody would just pray out loud because it was like the silence was like deafening and um, you were yawning. And, but sometimes it's in those times that we touch the heart of God in a way that perhaps we don't when there's a whole lot of noise going on. 
So let's not try to evaluate spiritual things with our natural thinking and our natural eyes. So that's my first point, you know. You know, in our weak times of prayer, we might not feel like we've moved the heart of God, but we can move the heart of God, can't we? And um, we have to have confidence that our prayers are being heard regardless of how we feel while we're praying. Sometimes we can feel elated because we're on the rooftop about some stuff that's happening. Sometimes we can feel down in our bootstraps. But it doesn't matter how we feel on the natural level. As we begin to pray, God begins to move. And in 1 John 5 and verse 14, it says these wonderful things. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. He hears us. So when tonight John reads the scripture and talks from the book of Joel and talks about, God, you said in the last days you'd pour out your spirit on all flesh. The second I've just repeated that, God heard me. His ears were pricked up because he said, ah, hang on a minute, that's something I said. <laughs> My children are saying, you know, when your kids say with the stuff that you say, sometimes you cringe, don't you? You know, we have we, all our little sayings and nuances in our families, and then when your kids start to repeat some of the stuff that you say, you go, oh, no. But that's just how God is with us, I'm sure. When we begin to confess his word, you go, wow, that's what I said. <laughs> and I meant what I said. Let me read that scripture to you again. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, that's his word. His word is his will, isn't it? If I say, oh, this is what I want to do, that's my word is my bond, his word is his will. The Bible says he hears us. Even those times when we poorly word the prayer. Have you ever felt like that when you've got in a complete and utter mess with what you're trying to say? It's almost like, you know, I've got to get it down and I've got to say it right because God won't understand. Listen, God reads our hearts. Sometimes we get emotionally messed up and mashed up. But I believe that God hears us. And... Um, the scripture says that we're able to come to the throne of grace. Not the throne of literary excellence. He's not looking for you to be the poet laureate. I think sometimes that's, that's a disservice as well. Because when you get grow up in church, there's some good prayers, isn't there? Some people that have really learned how to pray and articulate some words to God. And then when you stumble over your three or four sentences... You kind of feel like you're doing everybody a disservice and that God really doesn't want to hear what you have to say because he's not as polished and as good as anybody. Listen, God loves us, you know. We're his children. What we say to God really, truly matters. Whether it's just a few words or whether we're more articulate than others, it doesn't really matter. God's not looking for the articulation. He's looking for the heart and he's looking for our faith. And actually, he's looking for us to use his word. He's looking over his word, the scripture says, to perform it. Just like he says about in, 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 when he's looking for worshippers. God God's looking all the time. God's fascinated by his children. He loves us. He's looking over. He's got these spiritual binoculars and he's looking all over the world to see who will be worshipping him in spirit and in truth. And the scripture says he's looking over his word to perform it. So let's not go down this road, well, I wasn't very articulate. You know, sometimes the scripture says we don't even know how to pray, but the Spirit helps us. Sometimes it's just groans. We, he's not even speaking in tongues. Sometimes you're just on your knees and go, oh, God, help me. And God, God knows what you're trying to say. He knows the possibilities and the problems that you're going through. And he just listens all the same. He knows the cry of our hearts and the groan. He sees our tears. He's not really interested in the well-constructed sentences. But he wants just to know as his children that we love him and that he loves us. I think so. So sometimes I just want to just get this point across because sometimes prayer can be hard. It has sometimes to go from discipline to desire to delight. And sometimes it has to start off in that discipline area. And if it does, please, please don't worry about your emotions. What has that ever had to do with serving God? It's called obedience and faith. God doesn't judge us by how we feel. He judges us by our faith because without faith it's impossible to please him. And don't worry about the words that you can put together or not put together. Because he's listening anyway. Our private times of prayer and our public times of prayer may not move us. But I tell you something, when we're praying according to God's will, it moves the angels. It moves the hearts of God. It might not be what we're feeling, but it's what God is doing as we begin to pray. As we come into agreement with his word, our weak prayers actually become very, very powerful. 
I want to show you something that's absolutely beautiful tonight about somebody in the Bible that we don't often talk about or read about. And it's a bit of a one-off scripture. But I want you to understand that, you know, God is, is looking at our prayers. And he's, he's, he's looking at them and he's, 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 he's putting them in a bowl. And he loves, he loves his children to pray. He loves his children to articulate their love towards him. And in Acts chapter 10, there are just a couple of verses about a man called Cornelius. I, I didn't see this before until I started studying this out for this word. <coughs> Cornelius had an angel, a visit of an angel coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, and when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? He said to him, your prayers and your arms have come up as a memorial before God. Cornelius was a, a Roman soldier, and in the book of Acts, we find out he's had a little prayer meeting. And in this little prayer meeting, one that perhaps he doesn't really, he perhaps he didn't get much out of it or he didn't get much emotional stimulation out of it or he didn't even feel like he prayed very well. In this prayer meeting, an angel shows up and the angel says to him, your prayers are being remembered. What does that mean? I believe what, he, what the angel is saying to him, not only are your prayers being heard in heaven, they're going to be remembered forever, Cornelius. What you've just said has so moved the heart of God, heaven is not going to forget what you've just prayed. I think sometimes we, we underestimate our prayers. And some of the prayers that we've prayed, God will remember for always. They go, do you remember when you prayed? Do you remember when you prayed for that man from outside Diazda? Do you remember? I'm going to remember that for always. Because look there, what I was able to do, as you prayed in faith, according to my word, I came. Prayer is incredibly powerful. And I just want to, just for a few moments, just to... Um, Quickly just look at praying in faith. Praying in such a way that our prayers actually have a tangible result. I think sometimes we struggle with that as well because sometimes there's a time lag between our prayers and what God then does. Or sometimes God chooses to answer our prayers in a different way. But listen, God heard you. Don't ever be under the illusion that God did not hear what you prayed. And uh, God wants us to pray. He wants us to pray in faith and he wants us to put our confidence in him. He wants us to pray in the name of Jesus. There's no other name, is there? You know, we, we come with boldness to the throne of grace because of Jesus. So we can use the name of Jesus as a powerful weapon in our arsenal as we come to pray. As we, he's given us his name. He's given us his name. I think I've told you this before, but in the, in the Old Testament, when two chiefs, made a covenant with each other. Two opposing families, and uh, they would come together and they would cut a blood covenant. And during that blood covenant, they'd cut, cut their hands and they'd mingle their blood. And they'd do some stuff. What they'd do is they'd swap weapons belts. So this guy's got like two mallets, a hammer, a big sword, and his mate's got daggers and this, that, and the other. And they'd swap weapons belts. So... Everything that I have to fight with, I'm going to give you. And everything that you fight with, you're going to give me. That's just like our God. He says, the weapons of your warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God to the pulling down the strongholds. And, and then he says to you, you need to put on the whole armour of God. So here's my weapons belt. And they used to change cloaks. So they used to put a cloak around each other. You have my coat and I'll have your coat. But probably one of the, one of the most profound things is they used to swap names. Jesus has given us his name. Isn't that amazing? In the covenant that he cut on Calvary, we have no right to, in any way, shape or form, to use the name of Jesus, but he has made covenant with us. This is your mind now. And it's, you know, it's powerful. If I told you my name was Rockefeller, you'd believe I've got a few pennies in the bank, wouldn't you? I've got a better name than Rockefeller. I belong to Jesus. I've been born into the family. We're not, this is not the mafia, this is, this is the kingdom of God. And we serve the king of kings and the lord of lords. But Jesus talks very often about the prayer of faith and so does the New Testament. In James, in the book of James, he says, and the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. So James is calling us to pray in faith, believing God, take him at his word, using his name, taking the blood and pleading the blood and praying that God will move mountains. Because faith moves mountains, the scripture says, doesn't it? 
And then Jesus looking at the centurion. He said, I can't believe you. He said, I've not seen faith like this, not even in Israel. You know, you, you truly trust me. You, you're a man under authority and you, you know what it is to send servants. And he says, as you have believed, let it be done to you. As the centurion operates in faith, God shows up with answers for him. And then here again another verse from Matthew's gospel. He touched their eyes talking about the blind men. And he said, according to your faith, let it be done to you. We need to intentionally grow and cultivate faith in our hearts towards God. That might be strange, isn't it? That, you know, we call ourselves people of faith. We say that we have a faith. But faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God. That's why it's an absolute imperative that we get along to the Bible studies and to the main services. And I just see more and more that we need to be teaching God's word because it's the word of God that changes us. And it's the word of God in us as we pray that makes an incredible difference. Because we're not praying, not, it's like with Jesus, not what I want, but what you want. How do you know what he wants unless you know what his word is? How do you know what his will is unless you ask him? And, and search, it, search it out in the scriptures. We can spend so much time praying things that, you know, that are really, really don't count for anything at all. God wants us to pray his word. He wants us to pray his will, believing in faith that he will do what he has already promised. We need to hide God's word in our hearts and we need to put it in our mouths to pray. And if you don't know what to pray, the best thing to do is open the Bible and start praying scripture because it will make a difference. Go take the book of Joel. Go take a psalm. If you're feeling down in the morning, get the 23rd psalm open and start saying this, the Lord is my shepherd. I'm not going to want today. God, I am not wanting for anything. That's what your word says. And just go all the way through it. And by the time you've finished, you'll be having a praise party and you'll be bouncing on the way to work. When we take God at his word and pray in faith, believe him. And we must build, you know, uh, we must build on the faith in the word of God. And I have to say this very carefully, not on our past disappointments. I know many Christians whose prayer life has shriveled because they look at the disappointments of the past rather than basing what they're praying now in the word of God and moving in faith now we've all had our disappointments believe you me if I went around this room with a microphone I'd say how many times did we pray for so and so they had cancer they died we prayed for so and so that didn't happen and there can be a disappointment there can be a true disappointment that comes with that that we prayed so hard and it didn't happen but friends we cannot if we're true followers of Jesus Christ the next morning we have to Get up the next morning, take up our cross again and follow him, regardless of the disappointment. Do you know what I'm trying to say? This is incredibly important. We cannot drag the Bible down to the level of our experience. You can't read the book of John like we're reading through in this 21 days and say Jesus is not a miracle worker. We sung it on Sunday, didn't we? Way maker, miracle worker. Light in the darkness, that is who you are. And he says that you're going to do greater things than I've done than, than when I go to the Father. And then go, well, actually, I, I don't see that for my own life. The, the, when at times I've prayed, it's not, never been like that. Now I'm going to make, what, what we're now doing is dragging God's word down to the level of our experience instead of trying to raise our experience to the level of the Bible, which is the high watermark. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We need to put his word in our mouths and in our eyes and in our ears. And regardless of what the enemy says, and regardless of what we have seen up to this point, trust the Lord. What did Job say? Though he slay me, still I will trust him. I don't understand why some of our prayers haven't been answered in the way that I thought they might be. But I'm going to trust the Lord. I'm going to trust him with absolutely everything. What does scripture say? Though the, the, the vat's empty and the manger's bare, yet I'll still praise the Lord. It's very, very important because I, churches and individuals, I know because I'm an observer of people and I've been in this game for a long, long time now. I'm 52 and I've, I've been preaching for a long, long time and working with people and talking to them about their faith. And it, I've come to the conclusion that churches have been absolutely wrecked by disappointment. And individuals walk with Jesus has been stunted because of disappointment. You know, I want to say tonight, I'm not disappointed with God. Maybe I've been disappointed by some of the outcomes of what I've seen, but I want you to know I'm not disappointed with him. 
And in fact, my faith is higher in him now than it ever has been. But don't let those things drag you down. We need to get back into the word of God and go again. You know, sometimes we fall over and stay down. Well, that's called defeat. Falling over and, and, and knocking the dust off your knees and getting back up again and carrying on. That's what you call Christianity. That's getting up every day, taking up your cross and following him. Look at Jesus when he bore the cross up to Calvary, up to Golgotha. He slipped and he stumbled. And that to put that cross back on his back how many times? Because the walk was hard. And no one is pretending this is an easy game. We're not just called 21 days of prayer and fasting and thought that heaven would fall and everything will be okay. This is for me, this is just reshaping and remodeling our focus again on where we need to be as a church. We start calling ourselves a house of prayer. It's about time we are a house of prayer. I mean, I was just blown out of my mind on Monday night when I go for a jar of coffee that a man might have been in this service on Sunday night and called me pastor at the gates of Asda. That has been out of intercession and prayer. I'm also out of obedience for some of you that have gone and touched him on the shoulder and given him some money. And one of the things that, you know, that was quite outstanding, I thought, um, at the prayer night that we had at Bethel, when, when they were talking about the homeless, he's the one guy that's looking after all the homeless in Wolverhampton. And, um, and he said, what about giving people money? And he said, look, don't you take that privilege away from me. If I believe it's something of God and I want to do it, I will give them money. Now, we need to be wise in that. Of course we do. Don't give people, give people drug money. But you know what? There are some people that just need a hand up and uh, need us to operate in faith and wisdom. That's what the gifts of the Spirit are about all again, isn't it? You know, we talk about the words of wisdom and discernment of spirits as other sort of kind of like little play things for church. They're not play things for church. They're weapons in our arsenal. That as we would go out and witness to people in the street, we'd go, man, that man's genuine. He's real. He's not on drugs. Jesus wants to bless him. Steve, give him a tenner. Tell him that you love him. Tell him come, that you want him to come to church. That man there, he's definitely on drugs. He needs mental help. He needs something else. How can you help him? There might be a different route, but we're listening to the voice of God all of the time. Because the word of God's in us and through us and to us. Now, faith is the title deed to what we possess spiritually. You know, in Hebrews it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. And just in closing, Jesus describes how faith operates. He indicates that actually in prayer, faith operates on two levels. And this is very, very important. Because some of us tonight are going to move into the first and then receive the second. I believe I've seen this several times just as I've been praying over these last few days. First is that we need to receive them by the Spirit. Here's what it says in Mark's Gospel. Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things he says, it will be done. And he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. The Amplified Version says this, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them in the Spirit, and then you will have them in the natural. That's how faith operates, isn't it? That we walk by faith, not by sight, declaring the things that are not as if they were. My mind is taken back. And forgive me for the nostalgia and the reminiscing. That's what you do when you get over 50. I was 15 years old. Judith will put me right if I'm wrong. 15 years old. And we had the filling station mission in Dudley. I was 15. Remember what it was like to be 15, young and stupid. Not knowing anything really. There was a dedication service for that building on the Sunday night after church, probably about eight o'clock when everybody had finished their services, and we went from Eve Lane with my youth group. I was 15 years old. The power of God came upon me in a way that I don't recall it doing for a, for a long, long time then, then and since, really. And I knew that my friends... And their parents would be saved. And I received it in that moment. And that fortnight was the most incredible time. 
and Simon and Matthew. And some that are not walking with Jesus right now. Made their way to the front. You cannot manufacture that. But the Spirit of God prompted me and my, my faith reached out into his heart and I received in that moment. And I knew, when I went back home and lay in my bed, 15, oh, you're stupid when you're 15. You know nothing when you're 15. I'm not so sure I know so much now, but 15. But I lay in my bed that Sunday night and I knew. I knew that that couple of weeks were going to be life-changing. And actually was the, part of the bedrock of the foundation of Sergi Community Church or Sergi Full Gospel Church as it was. Amazing what God did in those moments. We have to believe sometimes that we receive in the spiritual realm before we take it in the natural realm. I felt like that these last few weeks. It's like I've been praying for such a long time, believing, you know, I must when people say to me, how many people come to your church? I want to say five or six hundred. Five or six hundred people don't come, but I almost feel like I'm, I'm, I'm believing it before I'm, I'm, I'm seeing it. Do you know what I mean? And so when, when Sunday morning when we see, saw so many new faces, just incredible stories. I mean, like, I don't want to go over it again, but Sunday morning, to have a family in that I did a funeral for that live in Hale Zoe. You cannot believe how much I argued with God that afternoon that I went to see that lady. Again, expressing my deep concern that I was driving all over to the other side of Blackheath to do a funeral. And this woman would probably never, ever come to my church. And, and it's almost the Spirit of God just wants to slap you about sometimes and tell you how stupid you really are. And, and, the, and the fact that, you know, when I got there, she asked me to pray for her, which was, which was strange enough as it was. And then the weirdest graveside service I have ever done in my life. And then for her son to actually work with Lorenzo, the Italian guy who prayed out on Sunday, and say that he's going to bring her Sunday mornings because he can pick her up on the way. And she'd been crying to God and asking, how can I get to church? Because she wants to be here. We, we receive, I've received that, and I believe it in the name of Jesus, and much more. We've got to believe these answers are already in our hands. And so... Um, that was good. I, I didn't think I didn't think I was going to preach for that long. That's okay. Isn't it? I, I thought I just had a few thoughts there, but sometimes the Holy Spirit just overtakes you. Oh, but you know, please, please do not. Un I, I just I just wanted some of us to have a God moment, right? Like when I did when I was fifteen. So would you? No need to stand. Let's just close our eyes. And uh, some stuff you've been praying for, some of you. I, I want you. We're not into stuff that's a bit weird and wacky, but I just want you, as, you, as you're thinking about people that you've prayed for for a long time, maybe over a, a lifetime, perhaps some of you, or situations that need definitely changing, I want you right now to almost see your, your hands in front of you and, and see the hands of Jesus with the answer in them and, and believe that you receive. <coughs> but, but believe that the answer's there, there it is. Wow. What I've prayed for, God's giving me right now. It's not going to be very long before, actually, I see. Like when you were a kid and you we were waiting for that special present on Christmas morning. And it was wrapped up. It was yours since your mum had bought it and put it on the top of the wardrobe. But it wasn't until Christmas morning you ripped off the paper that you finally got it physically in your hand. But it was yours from the moment your mum bought it for you. God's purchased a lot of stuff for us. We just have to right now believe that we receive. Yeah. 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 Ooh. Right, I'm just going to pray a few things. If this is on your heart, then just say amen in your heart or out loud, it doesn't matter. Just pray some stuff over our lives and over this church. Father, we believe that we receive family members into salvation in the name of Jesus. As for us and our house, we will serve the Lord. That is your will. That is your word. We believe that we receive in the name of Jesus. Whatever they think about us, whatever they've decided to do that is anti-God, whatever way they've decided to poke their nose and walk in an opposite direction, 
We believe that we receive in the name of Jesus. For those among us, Lord, that just need a physical touch and strength, Lord, for some, I just feel, for many of our older folks, arthritis and aches and pains, God, we, we, we believe that we receive some just a fresh touch from you, a fresh blessing that we might serve you strong right to the end. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Like Joshua, we want to make some words of declaration, you know. I feel as strong now as I did in them days when I went to spoke the land for going in and going out and making war. He was an old guy, but he got fired up with you again, Lord. Strengthen us, we pray. We believe that we receive. Over the finances of this house, we have so much to do, Jesus, so many people to reach out to, and we don't have enough money in the bank to do what I believe that you're asking us to do. So tonight, I believe that I receive. All the finances that we're going to need to meet the needs that are coming our way. And uh, for all the new people that are coming in, we believe that we receive. Uh, we just see a whole bunch of people come through the door in the name of Jesus. And uh, just, I just pray that our hearts would reach out in faith and instead of just begging you, Lord, just go back to your word and say, Lord, you've promised. Thank you. We're believing that we're receiving this now in accordance to what you've already said. Your word declares that you, you know, we wish that none should perish, but all might come. In that case, I believe that I receive those that are perishing right now, those that are coming right now. Many more people, Lord, that are maybe let, rough sleeping tonight, Lord. Somehow, you gave us that glimpse at Christmas when we, those Christmas meals, they didn't come out from us, but you prompted our hearts and almost prodded us to say, shouldn't you have been doing that? We believe that we receive a fresh passion for the lost, and for those who are in hurt and need and broken and disappointed and so would you bless our lives and bless this church together we pray in the name of jesus we say together the lord's prayer shall we our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.